Welcome to Awaken the Mind, the NLP and Hypnosis Guide, hosted by David Juhas. You're listening to Awaken the Mind, the NLP and Hypnosis Guide, a podcast that inspires the curious to the professional to discover meaningful content and pursue their passions. My name is David Juhas, and I'm a master NLP practitioner and hypnotist, best known for losing over 100 pounds and running six marathons in two years. And I'm sitting down with hypnotists, NLP practitioners, and coaches to talk about their process, the lessons they've learned, and how to make an impact in the lives of others. Our guest today is Lilia Falgatter. Lilia holds a Juris Doctorate degree, is the founder of In Spirit Books and Music, has a passion for education, and has experience in online learning as an administrator and instructor. She is also a writer of nonfiction books, a poet, and a songwriter. Lilia is the author of How to Catch a Man, The Most Important Letter You Will Ever Write, and The Five Decisions That Can Transform Your Life Forever. She writes and teaches on the topics of relationships, personal growth and development, and content development. Lilia currently teaches several courses on Udemy, coaches aspiring nonfiction book authors, and teaches others how to use books and courses for brand building and creating passive income streams. Please welcome our guest today, Lilia Folgatter. Hi, Lilia. Hi, David. Good to see you. (laughs) It is so good to see you. I am so excited to have our talk today. How's everything going in your world? It's it's blazing hot here in Arizona. You you walk outside and it feels like um, you know, you're, you're, somebody's throwing flames at you. It's really just quite incredible. Now you feel like, um, you know, like you're in an oven or something. But aside from that, everything else is perfect. Well, I love Arizona. Some of my coaching training was in Tempe, Arizona. And uh, I want to say it was, maybe it was March or April. And someone, we were sitting outside in the sun on the patio. And it felt like it was like in high 70s, low 80s from Illinois and someone said did you hear it got up to 105 today I'm like when and they said right now I'm like you got to be kidding me and sure enough I pulled out my app and it was 105 degrees and I wasn't even breaking a sweat I could not believe it however of course in the summertime that's a different story (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah UK if you were here in March or April it's beautiful then just perfect perfect weather Oh, and, and it is so beautiful in Arizona. Uh, the, the colors are so different from, from where I am from. And uh, but also my grandma and grandpa, they lived in, in Tucson, Arizona. I don't know if I ever shared that with you. No, you didn't. That's my hometown. Really? Oh, my goodness. Wow. What a coincidence. Yeah. Well, um, the reason we are here today is to learn all about you. And, of course, I know some about you and I would like to learn more about you today as well as our guests get to know you today and uh, tell me about your growing up what you did in school or anything activities that you like doing and anything you want to share certainly certainly well I grew up in Tucson Arizona as I mentioned and I went um, you know through school there I went to elementary junior high high school, and then went on to the University of Arizona and um, earned my degree there, bachelor's degree, and then went from there to the law school in Arizona, the Arizona College of Law there in the heart of Tucson. And so um, I just love Tucson. It's completely surrounded by mountains, and it, it has that hometown feel that the Phoenix area lacks, although there are so many other benefits in the Phoenix area and the suburbs, which is where I live in in Chandler. But in any event, um, I loved growing up in Tucson. It really is a wonderful community and I enjoyed going to school there. So, you know, as I said, um, we had an upbringing much like most people across the nation in those years when I was growing up. And um, so, you know, just a very, very, secure environment, very wholesome upbringing, if you will. Nice, nice. And when did you start writing 
books or getting into the arts as far as singing and poetry? How did that, that all come into your life? Well, first of all, I, I, I have always loved music. I think music has always been part of my life, listening to it. Um, there are some people in my family that play the guitar and other instruments. And so it's always been something that's been part of my life. And I love all genres. I'm not, you know, I love country, I love classical, I love uh, jazz, I love everything. And um, it's just something I think that comes from within. I don't know, you know, I, I don't think that's something that's necessarily developed. I'm not sure. I don't, haven't read any studies. But on the other hand, um, you know, it's been something that's been part of my life. Now, the writing, actually, I didn't discover my passion for writing until I was in college. And I took a, a creative writing course. And I think that is really what spurred my interest and made me realize, wow, this is something I'm really passionate about. But, um, and, and I'll tell you this a little bit more about this later, but, but basically um, it wasn't until I was inspired. It's one thing to have a passion. And it's another thing to be inspired to act on, right? right. And so, any, so that's, um, you know, so that's how I discovered writing early, but I wouldn't actually delve into it until several years later. And I'll tell you how that happened. Share with me the distinction between, you just said it about uh, having passion and an inspiration. What, what is the difference between the two? Sure. Well, to tell you a, a little bit more about it, because I think this is a, a good example. The, the very, first time I discovered my passion for writing, I never really considered it a career. I was studying something else. I was studying public administration, and that's what I eventually earned my bachelor's degree in. But anyway, um, I wasn't actually inspired to write until a very important event happened in my life several years later. Um, we, lost a, we lost a close family friend to cancer, and it was that loss that inspired me to write the book. And the reason that it came about, the, and again, the title of the book is The Most Important Letter You Will Ever Write, which is a long title, but it's descriptive. And then the subtitle is How to Tell Loved Ones How You Feel Before It's Too Late. And so I think that's very, that encompasses everything basically. It explains what's in the book. So um, it was that loss of, of a close friend, and we happened to be attending my husband's family reunion in Iowa. When we came back, my sister delivered the news that she had passed away. And the interesting thing is that I always had hope that she would beat cancer because she was a very upbeat, positive, um, looked very healthy you know, person, and uh, was very active. And so anyway, I always, sort of in the back of my mind felt like she's going to beat this. Well, as it turned out, she didn't. And we happened to be away when she passed away. And when we got the news, um, I sort of went into uh, a depression. And I thought about all of the things that she had been part of as, as a family friend, all of the really important events she had been part of. So, um, so I decided to write her a letter. And as I was writing the letter, I, I used a specific process for getting my thoughts down on paper. And as I wrote my letter, I thought, you know, how easy it would have been to just tell her how I felt when she was here. Um, and, you know, instead, I had to write it in a letter and then hope that somehow my words made themselves, you know, made their way to her wherever she was. And so anyway, so that was how the inspiration came about. So having a passion for writing was one thing, but then finding the inspiration that would spur me to write a book. And I made it my mission, David, at that point to try to get as many people to communicate their feelings to loved ones before it was too late. I didn't want anybody else to find themselves in that same situation where they regretted not having said certain things to the people that they love before they passed away. And so that, that's how the book came about. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that was interesting was because so many people find it uncomfortable to express their feelings face to face, I used this writing process and I called the letters loving letters. So that's what the, the book walks uh, people through that process. 
and, um, and you know, to how to communicate your feelings in writing, why it's important, why you shouldn't put it off, and um, just, you know, overall, the importance of doing that. Nice. And you also then went on to share that not only in your book, but you created workshops. Tell me about the workshops. Absolutely. And this is for your listeners. If you are, um, whether you're considering writing a book or not, workshops and writing books and creating other things, and I'll, I'll talk about what those are in a little bit, but those are things that help you build your brand. If you are um, a coach or have any business um, of any kind, and, and you have a brand that you market or that you're trying to build, these are all excellent ways to add to building your brand, to help build it, the, the name recognition. And, you know, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But yeah, you're right. I mean, I created a workshop. And um, the workshop that I created was one by the same title, the most important letter you'll ever write. And I taught it at the community college level and also to groups, religious, secular, um, and, and the purpose was the people come to the workshop and they listen to me talk about some of those things. And we, we have conversation about, you know, the importance of communicating feelings and why people don't do it. And, and it was, it, it was a really a powerful workshop because, um, you had people crying, you know, you had people in tears. Um, I remember going out to the office of the community college where I was teaching the workshop and I said do you have tissues I need you know I need Kleenex do you have any and she said why and I said well people are crying and she said you made people cry <laughs> in your workshop and I said yeah but it's a good it's a good reason it's a good reason and so anyway we ran so I ran back but um it was interesting I was always wondered I was always wondering why you know people would enroll in in the workshop what were their what, what were, you know, what inspired them to come to the workshop. And so I had one gentleman who was the CEO, had been of a major corporation for many years, and he had recently retired. And he came to the workshop, and he said that for all of those years that he was working and traveling to support his family, to provide a wonderful life for them, that he realized later how much he had missed how many birthday parties, how many dance recitals, how many, you know, things that he had missed that his children were part of. And he said, and the sad part, he said, is I don't know if they know, in spite of all my, you know, acts to, to provide and make sure that they have a good life. I never, I never really knew if they knew how much I loved them. He said, so that's why I decided to come today. Then I had another another person stand up and say that she had lost her brother last year, you know, the prior year, and that he had committed suicide. And she said, and we were close. She said, and how I missed signs. And, you know, she said, I don't know. We had a very difficult childhood growing up. And so we were very close. And she said, so the, the fact that he did this, she said, this really set me into a spin. Um, but she said, as, much, as close as we were, I never took the time to tell him how much he meant to me, and that's why I'm attending the class. And so the stories went on and on, you know, about why people were coming to the class. Um, clearly, they wanted to be able to explain and, and um, communicate their feelings to their loved ones, but didn't know how to do that. And what happens is in this workshop, you write a couple drafts of the letter and a final draft, and you come out with a finished draft of a letter to a loved one. And that becomes a pattern, you know, or, or a process that you can use then going forward to send a letter to any of your loved ones. Nice. So not only is there value in saying some, saying what you want to say or what needs to be said while they're alive, but there, it sounds like there's even value for yourself to heal by saying it even after they're gone. Right. And in, in most cases, uh, like the gentleman that was the CEO and the woman who had lost the brother, they were writing to those loved ones that were here 
but there have been people in my workshops who have used it as a therapeutic process, as you indicated, um, to communicate feelings um, and, and release their own feelings on the subject. So yeah, you're right. You do so many things. I didn't realize this about you. And of course, uh, our backstory is that I found you through Fiverr looking for a book coach that I'm, I'm writing. And so share with us about what you do with book coaching. Okay, so um, basically the book coaching is for, well, I do coaching for all types of writing, um, but the writing, the writing of nonfiction books is what I specialize in. And so I have written several nonfiction books. I've got a, a few nonfiction books coming out fairly soon and I've also um, I'm also trying my my hand at romance if you will a romance novel of fiction so so I haven't done that before so it'll be interesting <laughs> I've written short stories but that's about it and so anyway so working with with authors or aspiring authors who don't have a lot of experience at the moment but they will uh, soon and um, who need somebody to talk to and talk about the process, you know, what's involved, how you, how do you get started? How do you overcome problems like writer's block? Um, you know, what, what is the book organization and format? Um, just the entire process from beginning to end and including, you know, what happens um, and how do you get your book out there once you have written the manuscript? The, the majority of it is with reference to creating a complete manuscript within a certain period of time, whatever goal that individual sets. And so what happens though, is that, you know, we start from the very basics from the beginning. I'll answer any questions about um, writing, writing the book, the writing process, editing, um, and, and then, you know, eventually publication. You mentioned writer's block and I experienced that going through the process. And what is, what is it that creates writer's block usually? Is it something specific or are there different reasons? And what are some things that people can do to get unstuck and moving forward? Right. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. It is individual. And um, I think sometimes, you know, what, what happens is there are things that occur in life that distract us. Um, and you and I have had this discussion before that the importance when you have any goal, whatever goal it happens to be, if you have a goal, and this is what my other book is based on, The Five Decisions. And so the first thing is take responsibility. And that means that you are acknowledged that you are responsible for whatever happens or whatever doesn't happen. You take full responsibility and it falls squarely on your shoulders. Secondly, the second decision is that you have to decide what you want. You have to know what you want. In very clear, uncertain terms, you have to have a vision and you can, that you can feel, you know, see, hear um, very clearly in terms of the outcome that you want to, to accomplish. The third thing is that you have to have a plan, a plan of action with identifiable steps. And again, this is goal setting 101, right? Right. That you right. have to know exactly what you want. The third, the fourth thing, and the fourth decision is that you have to maintain focus. And then finally, the fifth decision is then once you've done those other five things, you've taken responsibility, you know exactly what you want, you put together a plan, you're, you've devised methods to be able to focus your attention on completing this plan. The fifth thing is just to let go. And so meaning that you have unwavering faith that you are going to be able to accomplish this goal or goals that you have set. And so when writer's block comes into play, when somebody's having writer's block, something has gone awry in the sense that they have something else that's weighing on their mind. Um, they have too many distractions and so they're unable to focus, um, you know, any number of things. <laughs> <laughs> but regardless of what that is, regardless of whatever is causing writer's block, 
you know that you've got it because you're having trouble moving forward. And so there are a few things that you can do to um, get rid of writer's block. And the very first thing that I recommend is freestyle writing. And freestyle writing is just taking either the unlined sides of uh, index cards, whatever size, the, the four by six or the five by seven, and or a larger sheet of paper that is unlined and then just start writing. And it doesn't have to be about whatever topic it is that relates to your book. It can be anything, your, your grocery list, you know, a to-do list. It's the idea is just to get you to start, um, you know, to get the creative creativity flowing again. So anyway, so that's one of the methods that I have used very successfully, not just for myself, but others have used it as well. And, um, and it helps you get going because eventually you're going to start writing something that inspires you that's related to what you're writing about. That's interesting. I didn't, I didn't think about it until just now. We, we had a guest on last week um, about improv. And there, there was uh, some talk about how we have our left side of our brain and our right side of our brain. And I can't remember which one is which, um, which one's right and which one's the other side. Um, but something about like we can get one side's more analytical and the other side's more creative. And sometimes we can get stuck in like analyzing stuff, overthinking it, as opposed to like what you were just talking about where you're just getting stuff out and just creating yeah, it's getting into that flow again, you know, to, uh, because at the beginning, you know, you remember, you have to try to remember what inspired you in the first place to start, in my case, to start writing and then um, try to get back to that, you know, into the inspiration. And one of the things that you and I had talked about is sometimes when you're inspired to write, um, it may be that certain settings are more beneficial that you, you know, we've talked about this, whether you go, whether you are more creative or feel more creative when you're sitting um, sitting on the beach somewhere in a in the coffee shop amongst the amidst the noise of the patrons at the coffee shop um, you know in in your favorite chair you know in a comfortable climate and so all of those things play into being able to focus as well as to maintain creativity but that freestyle writing is, is one of my um, my favorites because I think it's, it's extremely helpful every time that somebody encounters a roadblock, you know, or not roadblock, um, writer's block. You know, I was a little hesitant to get into it and I didn't feel like it. But then once I started, it's like, I couldn't stop. And I spent like a whole, like half a day and I, I couldn't type fast enough. I mean, I, my thoughts were just going. So um, they, they were just flowing. So it's, it's interesting. And it's also, I think, it offers hope to people who are, who are challenged with writing and they're stuck to know that just get started, just show up. And sometimes you'll be surprised. I mean, I was amazed how much I wrote. I think I ended up writing like two and a half chapters that, that week. And I, I, I was struggling getting words on the paper. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was really incredible. You were highly, highly productive that week. I remember it was I was very <laughs> impressed by how much you managed to turn out. I definitely highly recommend Lilia for coaching with writing books and also wanted to get to know a little bit more about you. There's some of these other areas that I didn't realize till I got your bio. Tell me about how to catch a man. <laughs> this is this is interesting. So there are three areas I three areas that I write about. I write about um, relationships and uh, goal, basically goal setting and goal, and achievement. And then um, what was it? well personal growth and development in general. And so anyway, um, so the How to Catch a Man is a book that came about sort of in an interesting way. Um, when my daughter was growing up in her, when she hit the, you know, the tween, the early, the early teen years, uh, right after, um, after 12, um, and she started, was interested in boys, you know, I, I was very eager to share with her, you know, information and knowledge about um, relationships in general and, and all of that. Well, first of all, Teenage girls do not want 
advice from their mother, especially about relationships <laughs> and especially at that age. And so what I decided to do was I started writing notes, um, writing down, you know, things that I thought were important that she know, not just as a, as a teen, but at some point in her life um, as, a, as an adult woman. And so I started writing information and advice and that eventually led to becoming a book. So that, that advice, advice from your mother, right, became a book. And so, and because I wrote it over the course of a number of years. So, you know, imagine from the time she was um, 12 or 13, to the time that she was um, 18, 17, 18, 19. And so anyway, so over that course of time, I had written advice. And so finally I thought, I, you know, the light bulb went off and I thought, oh, you know, I'm gonna put it in a book, it's gonna be a book. And so sure enough, and it's titled, How to Catch a Man, which sounds like an old fashioned sort of an idea, you know, or thought. But it's not what you think. And uh, the book is, is written, um, you know, in a way different than, than the title might imply. But the book is How to Catch a Man, The Single Lady's Guide to Fishing for Love and Romance. And it's got that fishing theme because um, fishing requires the right equipment. It requires um, an enormous amount of patience and time in some instances. And so, you know, some of those things or some of those skills that you need for fishing are also skills that you need to not only find your mate, but uh, maintain the relationship over time. And so anyway, so that's how that came out. It was kind of a fun, you know, a fun book. And it's intended, um, again, it was, it was more advice. It's not, certainly I'm not a professional I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist, uh, you know, and, and I don't, uh, I don't practice um, that. And so the, the book is more from the perspective of what you would want your daughter to know. Nice. nice. It's, it's interesting. I didn't think about this till you, you mentioned that I had, and I don't know what the statistics are of people that want to write a book, but I think it's like four out of five people or something like that. You know, everyone's, or no they've, kidding. or they've started one and it's not finished. And so I accumulated a lot. Of course, my background is in self-development. And so I was just, a, a lot of the things that I would hear, I was like, this is just so good. I've got, I want to make sure that I remember this. And sometimes it was scripture or it would just be something that, that I heard somebody say. And I just started to accumulate and I had, oh, maybe 12, 15 uh, spiral bound books that I still have that I'm using as material for the book that I'm writing right now. So that's, that's good to hear that you were accumulating it around a specific thing about the advice that maybe she didn't want to hear at the time, but <laughs> you, you, but great advice to, to be heard uh, maybe to other mothers or to other, other kids. And uh, I, I think that's, that's awesome. And, uh, yeah, and I'm happy to say that she not only read the manuscript before it was published, but helped to edit it as well. Oh, that is wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that, so I, I love it. Um, and, and again, you know, it, it talks about um, basically, um, you know, it's basically dating advice and how to, how to find um, a mate and how do you know your mate is the right one? And then um, red flags and you know different things red flags um anything from little things to to things that are more serious uh, that you yeah. can identify as potential problems down the road um and so anyway it was it's just as i said it was a fun project and it, it came together based on those notes and that information possibly a dad is raising a child this would be a good book to pass on um, to, to gain this information because I'm divorced and uh, my kids are now grown up. There's definitely the value of the mother. And I always told the kids, this is like, listen, you know, there's great value that, you know, your mother has to offer. And, but I also felt that missing as a dad. So I think it'd be a great book for a, 
a single dad to read as well. I recommend the... it to everyone. I think you can find good tips in there. Tell me about uh, some of the other things that you do, where you've taken these books and where they have gone. So early on, you were talking about the most important letter you'd ever write and how that evolved into a workshop. And then you were alluding to that there was something else beyond that. Is that correct? You've mentioned the first two books. Um, the, the first one was the most important letter you'll ever write. And then the second one actually is the five decisions. And that's the one that um, in, it re- refers to those five decisions. And, um, you know, it really is intended to help you accomplish goals. Because one of the things that you, that you would find, David, and this is for everybody, that if you look back at those goals that you have achieved throughout your life, the ones that you've achieved, right? So you set a goal and you achieved it. If you think back to those, to that goal or those goals, whatever, you know, if it's more than one, um, what you are going to see are common threads in what you did to achieve those. And those common threads are what I call the five decisions. And it's those five decisions that we talked about earlier, the deciding to to be, you know, to take responsibility. That was the first decision. And then um, know what you want. Third was put together a plan of action. Fourth was focus your attention on that goal. And then fifth was let go, which basically, again, translates to have faith that you're going to be able to accomplish it. So all of those five things um, applied together and applied consistently will help you achieve practically any goal that you set. And so, and of those five decisions, and people have asked me this, which one is the most important? And I always come back to, to number four, the fourth decision, which is decide to focus. Because even if you do any of those other things, if you're not focused on that goal, you're not going to be successful in achieving it. And the reason that we can't focus is because we have a life, right? And so, for example, anybody that's writing a book, if your goal is to write that book and you make it a priority, then you're going to do, uh, take steps to create a situation where you're able to focus on being able to do that, on getting that book completed, right? But when life is, when life is happening around you, um, it just, it detracts, it detracts, you know, it, it allows your attention to go elsewhere. And we are, as humans, we have this gift that we don't always acknowledge or appreciate. And that is to be able to direct our attention back to wherever we want it. And so if I have a crying child over here, if I have a telephone ringing over here, if I have, you know, that those things are going to distract me and take my attention away from whatever it is that I want to accomplish. If I'm having problems at work, if my car broke down, whatever it is, it's so easy to be distracted. But if you can control where your attention is going and where you are directing your attention, then that, you know, that's going to help you be successful. What are ways that we can maintain that focus? I think of the book, The Flight Plan, uh, Brian Tracy, where he talks about the pilot sets that goal. And I think it's 99% of the time the plane is off course because of winds and different things. How can somebody that is setting a goal make sure that they return back to that goal? And obviously, if it's important enough to them, they will. That is um, really a unique and individual thing because not all of the same things work for everyone. So it's not a one size fits all situation, but there are things that you can try and you will know what works best for you with reference to being able to focus. And that is you can engage in meditation and visualization. You can um, keep a journal that helps you, you know, if you're keeping a daily journal and you are writing down what progress you're making toward your goal, that that in and of itself allows um, you to not only stay motivated, but to maintain focus on what it is that you're trying to accomplish. 
sometimes also finding a mentor or working like in, in, in your case with me, you know, having somebody that can keep you and hold you accountable, that can be very effective. And, um, you know, and so all of those things, meditating, um, writing a journal, having somebody mentor you, any number of things that will help get you back on track. Because life does happen and we have to attend to other things, but it's when people fail to redirect their attention back to their goal is where they start losing sight of it. That's why so many people will set um, New Year's resolutions, but by the time that they get three or four months in, those resolutions, you know, they've lost sight of them. They don't even remember in some instances what they were hoping to accomplish. So anyway, yeah, so that's what I recommend, not just for being able to refocus, but then also to maintain inspiration or motivation as well. I really like the journaling idea. There's something about just getting your thoughts out on paper and not in a logical way. It seems to flow more. There's a comforting knowing I've got that thought captured and I can always go back and edit it or type it up or, or whatever, but at least I got that thought that was of value to me in that moment. Absolutely. You, you hit the nail on the head. Tell me about your, your Juris Doctorate degree. When I was in high school, I decided that I wanted, we had to write a career paper. I think it was in, um, as a sophomore or junior, we had to write a career paper, what we were interested in doing in the future. And so, you know, they, they try to help you in high school to, to try to think about what you want to do with your life. When <laughs> That's a good idea. Know what they want to do, right? <laughs> So um, I wrote a career paper and I did a lot of research and I found the attorney um, as a career path and, um, you know, being a lawyer. And so I researched it, wrote a paper, got a, a wonderful grade, got like an A plus on, on that paper. And I was so proud of it and so happy. And um, there were different things that were pointing me in the direction of becoming a lawyer. And at that point in time, I had not been that serious about my grades. I hadn't really been paying that much attention. So <clears throat> I quickly realized that to get into law school, that you have to get good grades in high school and college. And um, so I, I started working toward that. I happened to go to a career counselor, one of our guidance counselors actually, at the high school, um, to try to get more information and guidance from him about what other things I should be doing. And he said, honey, he said, why don't you look into secretarial school? He said, and I, he was trying to direct me away from going to law school. Well, I, I left there not shattered, but very uh, disheartened because I didn't know why he had said that to me. You know, was it sure. because, he was, you, you know, based on his age, he, and he was considerably older at the time, and his beliefs, he thought women should not be lawyers, that they should be secretaries instead. Um, did he think that I didn't have the ability to do it? Did he think that I wasn't intelligent enough? And so I really didn't know the reason, but here's what that did. It lit a fire under me and I said, I'm gonna show him. <laughs> I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go to college, I'm gonna go to law school, and I'm gonna be a fabulous lawyer. And so anyway, um, what happened was I got um, into college, I got into law school, you know, I took the law school admissions test, I got into law school, and by the way, any, and those were goals that I had set that tie back to what I told you, those five decisions are, all of those were common threads in my being able to achieve those goals. I knew exactly what I wanted, right? I just, I was responsible, nobody else was, only me. I knew exactly what I wanted. I made a plan of action. I followed it for many years. And then I, um, I, you know, I maintained my focus. That was exactly, I had blinders on. That was exactly what I wanted to accomplish. And then finally, um, you know, I, I had faith that I would be able to do it. And so I did. And once I got out of law school, I sort of, when I was studying for the, the state bar exam, I, I, I was uh, talking to a friend and at the moment I, I wasn't employed. I was fresh out of law school and I didn't have a job and I wasn't clerking in law firms anymore. 
And so she asked me if I was interested in teaching um, part time. And so anyway, as it turns out, that would lead me on a path to education, even though I did um, pass the bar and, and get my license. I ended up staying in education because what happened was that I discovered a passion for education and it wasn't by any plan, you know, that was just the way it worked out. I started teaching part-time as an adjunct instructor. I was asked to become a full-time instructor. Then I went from full-time instructor to within a very short period of time, they made me Dean of the paralegal program and then um, Dean of legal studies. So I had two other programs at, in addition. And then over time, as I said, you know, in, in within a couple, every couple of years, I was getting a significant um, promotion, but also I loved what I was doing. And so that's how I, it wasn't a deliberate choice to get into online education administration and, and online teaching, but that's how I got there. Just, wow. you know, you just never know what the plan is. Sometimes <laughs> You think you know what the plan is. But when I got my law degree, I wanted to look up that, that um, counselor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Say, see, I did it. Yeah. So anyway, but, um, <laughs> but the other thing that I wanted to mention to you, because we were talking about um, things that I've done with the books. And, and th one of the things, as you mentioned previously, is that I've um, taken a couple of my books and created online courses. And there are many platforms available. The one that I like to use, and you're familiar with it, is Udemy. And uh, on Udemy, you know, you, you create a course and then if students enroll, um, you get paid as an instructor. It's not a massive amount. There have been um, Udemy instructors that actually have been very successful and have made millions. But those were the early adopters, the early the instructors who got on board early and, um, you know, and started creating courses. Um, you can make quite a bit of money on Udemy if you create a course um, in a subject area that's in high demand. And a lot of those are technology type of courses, you know. Um, so anyway, so yeah, so yeah, so that's another way is to take it to help build your your brand is at end to build your um, your credentials is to have a course as well as a book. So a course, a workshop, a book, all of those things are means by which you can create passive income. I remembered you talking about like with the workshops, when I was uh, working on my book, you had talked about how, I believe you called it a pilot for gaining information on b before you write your book. Is that correct? Actually, um, I did it for both the book and the workshop because I was I developed them together. Um, I, I wrote the book and then developed the workshop based on the book, but then offered the workshop. Um, and what happened was I, I pilot tested it. And this is, I recommend if you're creating any sort of training or any course that you do a pilot, um, you offer it as a pilot. And then that way you can get feedback and work things out before you offer it live to anybody else. And nice. I think I mentioned to you for my workshop for the most important letter, um, what I did was invited um, six friends or family members and then six people I didn't know to come for free to attend my workshop for a couple of hours. I provided lunch. And basically what those people were were evaluators. They were my evaluators for the length of that workshop. And I completed, had them complete both written evaluations and then we had a, a discussion, an open discussion where I asked them questions and everybody commented. And then based on that feedback, I was able to tweak the workshop and, uh, and then going forward, you know, it was great. Do you have any new projects that you're working on or new books that you're working on? Yeah, the, the book that I had mentioned to you um, in one of our one of our meetings is is uh, on how to write your nonfiction book. It's basically the information, um, a lot of the information that we cover during the coaching sessions. But this is more of a step by step and sort of a, a global view of writing your book, your nonfiction book. How do you you know how do you go about writing it, and then um, the publication process as well. And so that's, that's about, um, I would say about, it's a little less than halfway complete. 
And so I want to be able to focus my attention my next the, these next few weeks to being able to finish that because then I also want to offer that as a Udemy course. And by the way, um, so the Udemy courses that I offer right now that I have on Udemy are the top 10 reasons to teach on Udemy, which is um, something that I, I created a while back. And um, it, uh, and I have the coupon links for anybody that wants to take it at the discount for $9.99. I have the link for any of the courses. Um, and all you have to do is go to udemy.com and then just write my name in Lilia Fallgatter and it'll pull up my courses, but then you need to contact me to get the coupon code. I can put a link on the, the, uh, podcast page. Okay. Or instructions, whatever you want. So the course is the five decisions, but, um, in Udemy, I call it beyond goal setting, the five decisions that can transform your life. And then I also have the how to catch a man course based on the book and um, brain, the ba brainstorming process for content creation. Um, and, oh, I have a, how to start writing your book. That's mm -hmm. different from the book that I'm writing. And that's because it's more of a, for people who write fiction or nonfiction on how do you start, you know, how do you get started? It's just the jumping off point. And so um, that recently got a good review from somebody that participated, um, who was very engaged in the course. So anyway, um, so yeah, so you can find my courses on Udemy. And as I said, um, by requesting via email, um, you can request the coupon codes. I also have them posted in various places. What are other ways that uh, our guests can get a hold of you if they're interested in getting some coaching or finding out about your books? Absolutely. My, um, my Fiverr gigs are listed under Lilia Lorena, which is L-I-L-I-A-L-O-R-E-N-A. -E That's my handle on it, it's, right? That's my handle on Fiverr is Lilia Lorena. And um, I also post information on my website, which is inspiritbooksblog.wordpress.com. And then I have blogs for each of the other two books, the um, Five Decisions and How to Catch a Man. Um, and so those links are also available in the, um, in the inspiritbooksblog.com page. And then um, my email is inspiritbooks at gmail.com. Uh, and then you can find me, of course, using Inspirit Books. You can find me on Twitter, on Facebook, Instagram, uh, on all the social media networks. Okay. And we'll post all of those links on the podcast page and how you can get a hold of Lilia. And I just realized we really didn't talk about it, but you're also a publisher. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. Inspirit Books uh, and Music is my business. It's an LLC. And um, I have to date um, published mostly myself because I'm so enthralled with writing. And so um, as a publisher, but I am able to publish um, other, you know, other folks as well. I haven't gotten quite to that point yet, but I, I think I'm hoping that before the end of the year, I'll get to that point where I can invite people to submit their manuscripts for publication. Awesome. Well, it has been a pleasure to see you again today and to talk with you. And I highly recommend uh, looking at Lilia to help coach you writing your book. I know my personal experience was that there was so much more that I didn't know that I didn't know about writing the book. And then also I got so much farther than I'd ever expected with writing my book. And my goal is to finish it, as I told you, uh, by it, this year, 2018. And I want to thank you for being on here today. And I will definitely see you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. You definitely are a firecracker boy. I tell you, <laughs> you really um, just, you know, hit the ground running when you started writing your book. And so I'm very proud of the progress that you've made. And I can't wait to read your finished manuscript or your final, your finished copy. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you for joining us today with yeah. Awaken the Mind, Relax. hosted by David Juhas. Ah, uh, awaken the mind. You need to understand. If you can't, you must. And if you must, you can. Now that I got you, let me put you in a trance. Got you feeling hypnotic. Your mind, let me massage it. Your thoughts are getting quiet. Your stress subsiding. You starting to see images, but it ain't no mirages. Think it's time to calibrate. Calibrate. Take a breath and concentrate. Concentrate. Get into your subconscious. Time to feel the energy. The brain waves. Let's go deep into your memory. Beware of self. Let the worries melt. All you see is you and you don't see no one else. Auditory digital. Talking to yourself. It might seem bizarre. A feeling you never felt. This is your time to shine. Awaken the mind. The NLP and hypnosis guide. Yeah.